Hello and welcome to Crash Course Statics, the video series where I'm going to introduce you to some of the basic concepts used in the field of statics. So before I go any further, I need to explain what statics is. Statics is basically using math to analyze structures under load. Now don't run off just yet, the math won't be that hard and I'm going to be doing it anyway because this is a YouTube video. And I also feel like I should probably give a bit of a disclaimer here. Statics can be used to build large, dangerous structures, such as bridges, buildings, and really just things people stand on that probably shouldn't fall over. So these videos will not be preparing you for that. I'm just going to scratch the surface of this massive topic. If you are interested, or discover that you're interested in this type of engineering, then you need to be formally trained before you go off and try to use any of this information to build things that could end up hurting people. In the second video, we will look at what happens when you don't fully understand statics, just to act as a final warning before we apply our knowledge in the third and final episode. But for now, let's get started with some of the basics. One of, if not the most fundamental concept in statics, is that of static equilibrium. Static equilibrium is a simple way of describing an object that's not accelerating. When you drive a car across a bridge, it stays in pretty much the same place. And this is where the term statics come from, as it has to do with static objects. So, how do we know that something is in static equilibrium? Well, like I said, the object can't be accelerating. And Newton's first law tells us that an object will not accelerate if the net force on it is zero. So at its most basic level, static equilibrium tells us that if a car that weighs 13 kilonewtons or 3,000 pounds is on top of a bridge, then the ground must be pushing up with the same amount of force plus the weight of the bridge. This means that these three forces cancel out resulting in zero net force and zero acceleration. This does get a little more complicated though, objects do more than just slide around, they also rotate. Luckily, the equations for rotation are pretty much the same. Force is replaced with a moment, which can itself be imagined as a force at a distance. If a force of one newton is applied at the end of a lever, which is one meter long, then the moment at the end is one newton meter. The force is simply multiplied by the distance. So, for an object to be in static equilibrium, the net moment must also be zero to keep the object from accelerating. This fact is actually very useful, and to explain why, let's go back to that bridge. To keep things simple, let's pretend the bridge is weightless, or at least very light. We know that the ground is pushing up with 13 kilonewtons, but where is that force actually coming from? The bridge is supported at each end, and if the car is in the middle, it's obvious that the force is coming equally from each end of the bridge. But what happens when the car is off to one side? Well, we can actually calculate the moment to find the answer. Now we can find the moment around any point on the bridge, or even off the bridge if we want, but there is a problem. We have two unknowns, the force at each end, which means we can't solve the equation unless we get rid of one. For a problem like this, the best way to get rid of a variable is to take the moment at a point where one of the forces is being applied. Let's use the left end of the bridge. This eliminates the force on the left because its unknown force is multiplied by a known distance of zero. This means that the moment is zero, and we can simply find the moment from the car and the other support, which is only one unknown. Again, this is just the force multiplied by the distance from our point. We set that equation equal to zero, solve it, and we get the force on the right side of the bridge. Then we can take the moment at another point, or we can just look at the net force or the sum of all the forces to find the left support. So now we've established that our object isn't spinning off into oblivion, but I want to go a step further. It's time to look inside the bridge at something called a truss. A truss is constructed of members which are connected at joints which are free to rotate. Imagine it like bars being loosely bolted together. Now let's make sure that we're on the same page about what a member is. It's one of these, an individual connector inside of the truss, and we're making two assumptions about these members. The first is that they are very light, meaning we can ignore their weight. The second assumption is that there are only two forces on any given member. 
these two forces are applied at the joints here, and they must cancel out. If they don't, it means that the member is not in static equilibrium, which we know is wrong because it's not moving. Because they must cancel, they will be equal in magnitude and in opposite directions. And they also must be parallel to the line of action. The line of action is simply the straight line between the two joints. The force is not necessarily parallel to the member though, because members can come in many different shapes, but this doesn't change the actual direction of the force. So hopefully you have all the background knowledge necessary for us to start solving a truss. There are different methods for solving a truss, but the one I'm going to explain in this video is the method of joints. So let's establish one of the basic rules of the method of joints, which is that you need to know at least one force on a joint, and you can't have more than two unknown forces. If a joint you're looking at has three or more unknowns, you'll have to look somewhere else first. Now we can simply start at a point that has a known value and one or two unknown values. The left support should do. Now this joint is our only focus. The rest of the bridge doesn't matter to us. We have the joint itself, simple enough, and the force from the ground. Then we have the two members. The first is horizontal, and the second is at an angle. Now, the exact direction of this member is very important for the math. You can use its angle, but that requires trigonometry, and to keep this video simple, I'm going to avoid trig and just use ratios. So instead of writing down an angle, I'm going to draw this triangle and write the ratio of the sines. In this case, the bottom of the triangle is 6 units, and its height is 8 units. What are these units? It doesn't really matter, because we just need a simplified ratio. In this case, the 6 simplifies to a 3, and the 8 simplifies to a 4. Now for the third side, we'll have to use the Pythagorean Theorem. Yes, you heard me right. You're actually going to use that in engineering. So the third side will be the square root of the width squared plus the height squared. In this case, it's just 5. So now it's time for the math. First, let's talk about directions. Up and down will be our y direction, and usually the up direction is positive. Left and right are our x direction, and right is usually the positive one in this case. Keeping these signs consistent is extremely helpful for solving these problems. So we're going to sum the forces in both the x and y directions, but which should we do first? Both members are applying a force in the x direction, and there's no support in the x direction, which means that there are two unknowns and no known values. So let's start with the y direction instead. This has one member and the support. The force from the support is positive because it's going up, and we will assume that the other member is positive for the time being. It doesn't really matter what you assume as long as you're consistent. So we need to find the sum of the support force and the y component of the member. To find the y component, we simply multiply the actual force, b in this case, by the appropriate ratio. This ratio will be the height divided by the hypotenuse, or 4 divided by 5. Now the sum is set equal to 0. Like I've explained, everything is in static equilibrium, so it always equals 0. We solve this, and it gives us our force B. Now we can sum the forces in the x direction. This time we have to find the x component of the force B, so we use another ratio. The width over the hypotenuse, which is 3 over 5. We set the equation equal to 0, and we can solve for a. a turns out to be positive, so we can leave the arrow the way it is. Now there's one more thing we have to do before we move on, and it has to do with sign conventions again. With two force members like these, the forces will be equal and opposite. So it's best to give them a sign based on whether the forces are facing towards each other or away from each other, or else things can get a little confusing. If the forces are pointed towards each other, then the member is in tension. This is like when you pull on a rope and it pulls back. Generally, a member in tension is considered positive. The opposite case is compression. This is like pushing on a spring and then it pushes back against you. And this is usually considered to be negative. So now we have to look at our forces. The force A is pointed towards the next joint. So it is in tension, meaning the force is positive. The force B is pointed away from the next joint, so it's in compression, meaning the force is negative. This is how you should actually record the forces, so you can easily tell the direction when you move to a new joint. Also, it is worth noting that the signs did not change in this case, but if we were at the other support, they would have. So it's always best to check whether a member is in tension or compression before moving on. 
So to solve the rest of the bridge, we just continue this process, one joint at a time. But I'm gonna end the video here. Hopefully you have the information you need to solve these problems. What you need now is practice, and that has to be done on your own. Come back for the next episode where we'll talk about what can go wrong if you don't do the math correctly. And after that, we'll solve these equations for a real truss and try to guess when it will break. But for now, I'm Con Hathi, and I will see you in the next video.